Chun Sung was a driver in the North Korean milita military, right? On November 13th, 2017, he drove a car to the demilitarized zone. Remember, he's a driver in the North Korean mi military. He crashed the car and then he ran for South Korea. North Korean soldiers, they pursued him. They shot 40 shots at him with pistols and AK-47s. He did not stop. He made it to the other side. And when they gave him medical attention, they found that he was full of tapeworms. So why would anyone risk their life in such a way? What was he running away from in North Korea? What hope did he have in South Korea? So welcome to Nahash and Kimemia Live. Thank you for all my subscribers, 919. Keep going. Please share these videos. Do not hide the light where there is darkness. And subscribe if you haven't subscribed. So today I'm going to be talking about capitalism versus socialism. Serikali in his idea. A response to David D. So why did I come up with this topic? Bill Gates said something and he was quoted on uh, social media. And he said, capitalism has worked very well. Anyone who wants to move to North Korea is welcome. So David Ndi, he responded to that uh, comment. And he said that uh, Bill Gates should have completed uh, college. He was implying that Bill Gates was wrong. He did not have enough information for him to praise capitalism and to ask people who don't like it to move to North Korea. And somebody asked him, uh, Mr. David Ndi, what did Bill Gates say wrong? And Ndi said he does not know where to begin. And he would actually recommend a course in welfare economics. And you can see that tweet right here behind me, where he says, he'd recommend a course in welfare economics. So I thought that I would, you know, delve into this. Bill Gates is from America. So how is the economic system in America? America is highly capitalistic and it also has a high level of income inequality. There's a high level of upward mobility. Opportunities are more equal than they are in other countries. For example, the equality of opportunity is better there than it is in Kenya. So that, that's just a point. So what experience did Bill Gates have when he was in America? Why is he praising uh, this system so much? This highly capitalistic system. His father was a prominent lawyer. His mother served on the board of directors for prominent companies. His parents wanted him to pursue a career in law. They wanted Bill Gates to be a lawyer. At 13, Bill Gates went to a private preparatory school and he wrote his first software program. So you can see the importance of having a good background. It gives you a stepping stone. But is that stepping stone enough, right? Because Bill Gates, uh, <clears throat> he dropped, okay, another experience, he dropped out of Harvard. And since 1987, he has been included in the Forbes list of world's richest people. He's currently worth $95.4 billion. That's a lot of money, right? And you can see why he'd praise America, why he'd praise this highly capitalistic system. And as you can see from the tweet, uh, D does not know where to begin. And he recommends that Bill Gates take a course in welfare economics. Because he feels, even though Bill Gates has made it thus far, perhaps he doesn't understand all there is to understand about economics. And perhaps because of that lack of understanding is why he is praising capital capitalism. So why did David D mention welfare economics specifically? Well, he did that because America is not a purely capitalistic society. It has some welfare system. Like for example, guys would get uh, checks when they, don't, when they don't have income. They would get food stamps and all of those other things. The state would come and it would cater to your welfare. So it's not a purely capitalistic society. And that's why I use the words highly capitalistic. And I think what is on this mind mostly are welfare states such as Scandinavia, which have done well. And then I think he also sees capitalism as greedy and welfare states as humane societies. And I think most of us have that kind of perception. Like uh, 
when we hear people are eating, people are getting rich in Kenya, the land of 10 million, 10 millionaires and uh, 10 million poor people. I think that was J.M. Karoki that said that back in the day. He copied that from somebody, I can't remember exactly who it was. But you can see how people would not want capitalism because we believe that capitalism is the problem. And welfare states, they're better. So what is David Ndee's economic position? Because he doesn't like capitalism, given from what he has stated. And he seems to have something to do with welfare economics. Perhaps there's something that he, he wants to teach us and perhaps Bill Gates on welfare economics. So is he advocating for a welfare system? Is he advocating for a mix of perhaps capitalism and welfare and a welfare system? Or is he conflicted about what he supports, about which system is best? So anyway, what is capitalism? And I will start according to David Lee. What is capitalism according to him? Well, I'm not sure if you can see it from the back, right? But he starts with uh, Marx's, Karl Marx's definition of capitalism remains unchallenged. I don't know if you can see that, but that's what he's trying to, to say right now. That uh, Karl Marx gave a definition of economics and it remains unchallenged. And this is what he says. If you can't read it, let me read it for you. The end aim of capitalistic production is to extract the greatest possible amount of surplus value. And consequently, to exploit labor to the greatest possible extent. Now, here's something that you'd notice. He'd actually call it uh, a Marxian definition of uh, capitalism. But is it really a definition? Because it starts, the end aim of capitalism, capitalistic production is to extract. So it's not a definition of capitalism. It's actually a, de a statement of the aims of capitalism. So here we, we will not find a definition of capitalism. And then we'll understand what he's talking about when we examine feudalism, which he also looks into as we go on. So in it, uh, another definition by David D when it comes to capitalism, right? I found this more of a definition. He says that capitalism is a form of industrial organization, right? And that capital hires labor for wages. He also says it would be a market economy if labor hired capital. But it would not be capitalism. So again, I'm not sure if you can see it. Next time I'll do a better job of that. But anyway, he says that capitalism is a form of industrial organization. And I feel that industrialism is a confined term. It's confined because... Uh, Capitalism is actually an economic system. Industrialism, everything that happens in the economy is part of that. Industri industrialism, right, is mostly mostly concerned with industries and all of those other things. There are so many other things that happen in the economy, including the service sectors and all of those things. And they would still fall into the uh, definition of capitalism. So I feel that his definition is a bit, you know, confined. And also at the same time, if he's talking about industry in terms of hard work, then that would actually be uh, a proper definition because industry is every kind of work that happens in the economy. So perhaps he's talking about that, which I don't believe it's, he is, but benefit of a doubt. Capital hires labor, that's correct, right? So, right, and then he goes on, if it would be a market economy, because he differentiates a market economy and capitalism, uh, if labor hired capital, and so my question is, when would labor hire capital, right? Because by the very definition of being a laborer, you are actually somebody who's hired to, to labor, to do something. That's your specific economic activity. But when you hire capital, right, then don't you become something else? Uh, you might say an entrepreneur, you might say a capitalist, you might say an owner of production. Right? Even if it's a temporary ownership of production. But a laborer by its very definition is somebody who works for capital. right? Because laborers can't sit on hired capital, but uh, entrepreneurs can. And many people do until they discover their potential. A laborer to receive a wage must work. So as soon as you hire capital, then you cease being a laborer. 
in my opinion you become perhaps a temporary entrepreneur or something so anyway expanding on his definition of capitalism right he actually says that feudalism uh let me see if that that one is there right yes he actually says that in feudalism i don't know if you can see it but at the back labor rents land in capitalism uh capital hires labor and in a market economy there is no prescribed ownership or an employment structure so this is what i heard about feudalism right in feudalism there are lords and then there are subjects i don't believe that labor rents land as such because then that would mean that they will voluntarily rent it take it when it comes to to feudalism they, there is no vol, 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 voluntary kind of thing it's lords and subjects you will work on that land you will give that person a portion a huge portion of whatever you produce and will remain with the little or you will die there are no choices to be made right so i wanted to give something else uh when the plagues happened in europe that's when actually it stopped being kind of like a a force system and it became kind of voluntary because the population of europe reduced at certain time i think by 30 percent so the laborers they had more say when it came to to doing work and they had more mobility because the kingdoms were a bit weak at that time and so that's the only time where feudalism where the laborers they actually had some kind of freedom to choose where to work and when to work but in the traditional sense it was not it was a compulsory system right and can there be uh, an economic system anywhere in the world where there is no prescribed ownership or employment structure i've never heard of that kind of economic system men will naturally tend to want to own or to own something and people who want to who did not have enough for some given reason or the other they will lend their services or their labor or yeah their services for a piece of it right so that's the way human society works i don't believe that yes especially in a market economy because in a market economy it's a natural kind of thing everything is free so in a market economy where there's no prescribed ownership i think that's a bit i don't believe that there's any person economist who would actually agree with that kind of thought so anyway just to move further let us examine his market economy a bit further right he says that capital land and labor are traded right yes factors of supply and demand i think i'll touch on that just a bit so he says capital land and labor they are traded in a market economy and then there's peasant agriculture and then also there is yeah before we move to that and then there's also capital right the peasants own land and they own capital and then there's no labor market only products are traded so yeah again i ask a question right the very first definition right didn't he say that capital land and labor are traded but then as we move to this last part he says there's no labor labor market so only products are traded there's a kind of inconsistency in his definition of a market economy and it starts from the beginning when it comes to ownership and employment structure and in this case it comes to the place of labor in a market economy i think there's a bit of inconsistency right and then also if a when it comes to peasant agriculture if a peasant owns land and he owns capital is he really a peasant in the traditional sense of the word because as we know from back in the day a peasant would depends on the land owner depends on the owners of of production but if he owns production if he owns land does he remain a peasant so this definition of david d where in a market economy a peasant owns land and capital then he's no longer a peasant and he's actually operating under a system that i would call capitalistic and then I'll, I'll move on yes so i believe that his definition of peasant his definition of land they're a bit problematic there are unclear definitions when it comes to feudalism right 
I don't believe that he defines them properly and he defines them with a bit of inconsistency. And then he has unrealistic concepts, especially where there is no prescribed ownership or employment structure in a free market economy. Like my friend Jera says, if the factors of supply and demand are working, right? Would we believe that no one would want to own something in that system? And for those who don't own for some given reason or the other, perhaps they are too late to move into the market, then would they not give their services? And of course, if they do that, then there's an employment structure. The definitions that David D gives, they're shaky. The concepts are unrealistic and the economic ideas would not stand on solid ground as per my, my understanding of economics. So let me move further to the father of economics. His name is Adam Smith, right? Some call him the father of economics. Others call him the father of capitalism. And this is what he says. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner. No butcher goes into his butchery thinking about you, how we'll give you meat so that you can feed your family, so that you can feed yourself. There is something else, not his benevolence, that draws him to do that. And that is what Adam Smith calls self-interest. He wants you to come and buy that meat, right? So that you can, you can give him something in return. And what are you going to give him? Security. You are going to give him money that he can use to pay rent, that he can use to buy clothes, that he can use for other things, right? To guarantee his own livelihood. And so that's what, according to Adam Smith, those are the building blocks of capitalism. And that's how it works. And he moves on further and he says, there is that thing they call the invisible hand. And this is what the father of economics says. By pursuing our own interest, we promote that interest of society. And we do that more effectively than when we sit down and then we start saying, you know, today, let's promote the, the, the benefit of society. Let's do this for society. Let's do that for the society. He actually says that you promote society more by seeking your own self-interest, by pushing as hard and as much as possible for what you love, for what makes you happy, and for what secures your interest, as opposed to meeting together and then deciding, let's promote society that you do not intend to promote the public interest and you do not know that you're doing it, but you are actually doing it and you're doing it more effectively than sitting down and planning for promoting society. And I wanted to go back to Bill Gates, right? His example of Bill Gates. So Bill Gates says this, right? Uh, <clears throat> when he was young, right? He used to exploit bugs in an operating system, right, to obtain free computer time. And uh, one of those bugs that he, he, he used to exploit was in the computer center corporation, right? And they banned him and his friends for doing that. So at the end of this ban, Bill Gates and his friends, they got together and they said, you know what, uh, computer center corporation, let's do this. Let's agree on something, right? I will, I will, uh, we will find bugs in your system and you will give us extra computer time. Remember he was in a preparatory school. It's called Lakewood School. So that's what he did when he was in Lakewood School, him and his friends. That he wanted computer time, right? But then to get this computer time, he would fix bugs for CCC, the computer corporation. And that's when you see capitalism works because he's seeking his own self-interest. But by doing so, he is promoting CCC. He did not start from the point of saying, you know, you guys have bugs. Let me fix it for you. No, he started from the point where I want extra computer time. And that invisible hand moved him to fix the problems that CCC were having. And let me go to another professor of business administration. He wrote uh, an article. It's called The Political Economy of Capitalism. And I wanted to use this because people would say, you know, David Lee is established 
and you are not established, right? So I wanted to use somebody who's established to bring forth this idea. And it's the mainstream idea in economics, right? For those who do not support econo economics, uh, capitalism, they are within the fringes of economics. But this is the mainstream thought. Even the father of economics, he agrees with this. And this is what this guy says. He's called Bruce. And uh, I'll share the link. If you want the link, mention it in the comments. An economic system, capitalism, his definition, is where private actors are allowed to own and to control the use of property in accordance to their own interests. Right? Where the invisible hand of the pricing mechanism coordinates supply and demand in the markets in a way that automatically benefits society. It benefits, it's in the best interest of society. So as you can see, let me move back to the Bill Gates example again, right? So guys have seen this guy is good at what he's doing, right? And they hire him and the students to write a pay, a company hires him to write a payroll program, right? For, for, for that company. And guess what they do? They provide him with computer time and royalties. Remember, computer time was everything that he wanted. Bill Gates and his friends. But now they've gotten something extra. Royalties. In exchange for their services. They are still the owners of their services. They haven't given, let's say, like they receive royalties. So they still own rights to what they are doing. And that is capitalism. You still own what you are doing. You still control what you are doing. But then somebody in society wants it. There's an interest in society that you're feeding. And that is what Bill Gates was feeding, an interest in society. But he still owned it and he received royalties on behalf. That company that had him, it's called Information Sciences Incorporated, right? So you can see how capitalism works, right? That everything remains within there. Uh, an individual owns whatever he's doing, owns his factors of production, and he does it for his own benefit, not for the benefit of society, right? Not for the benefit of anybody else. And in doing so, he benefits society. And where is the government in this situation? According to this professor, Bruce, from Harvard, the government is responsible for peace, justice, and collecting taxes. It shouldn't be anywhere else when it comes to capitalism, we shouldn't be having the government in the healthcare industry. We shouldn't be having the government in education. We shouldn't be having government in ICT, in all these other sectors. It should limit itself to peace, justice, and collecting taxes. And that is capitalism. Right? Another definition of capitalism, right, by the same professor from Harvard. Capitalism is a system of indirect governance for economic relationships such that there's this person who has this kind of work, there's this person who has this kind of service or good, and they need to, there's a relationship that they need to develop. So you are governing it, but indirectly. It's a system where all the markets exist within institutional frameworks. Like you have an institution like KEBS, you have an institution like uh, Communications Authority of Kenya, you have institutions that are working. And the markets are working within those frameworks of those institutions. But the government does not involve itself in those markets directly. For example, it does not come and provide universal health care because that's a direct intervention in the market. It does not provide, uh, let's say, education because that's a direct intervention in the, in the market. It does not provide finances because that's a direct intervention in the market. So when you have those indirect interventions, you do not have capitalism, according to this guy. And those institutional frameworks, the communications authority, the cabs and all those, they are supported by, by governments, the political authority, the guys who have the guns. So anyway, let's go to the structure of this capitalistic system. The markets are at the first level 
where competition takes place, right? Only the markets, not the government. But in Kenya, we also have the government in so many places where it shouldn't be. And then we have, like in housing, what is the government doing by producing house, houses? Those are supposed to be at the first level, the market level where entrepreneurs are competing to produce houses. The government should be at the institutional level, right? Which is the second level. And then now we have political authority that determines uh, the system. Political authority at the last level. Who will be president, what are those kind of things, right? So that's the structure of the capitalistic society. But do we have that in Kenya? So whatever is not working in Kenya is not really a capitalistic system that's not working because we don't have capitalism in Kenya. We have something else. And that's why it's not working. But if we had capitalism, things would be different. And perhaps we'd be praising like Bill Gates. So anyway, let me dwell into welfare economics a bit. Because David indeed dwell, delved into welfare economics, right? So this is Bill Gates, the billionaire. Yes, and this is what I wanted to say about welfare economics, right? Uh, the primary concern is the welfare of the producer and the consumer where you maximize profit for the producer and you maximize satisfaction for the consumer. So that's welfare economics. How I understand it, right? You are looking at the allocation of uh, resources within society in terms of the well-being of the consumer and the producer to maximize satisfaction for the consumer, to maximize profit for the producer. Where you would work at there, you would get to the market equilibrium and how would you do that? Through the invisible hand. So when David D says that Bill Gates need to, needs to go into a welfare economics class, this is what welfare economics will teach him. The invisible hand, maximizing profit, maximizing satisfaction for the consumer, market equilibrium. In other words, it would teach him concepts of capitalism. So even by David D saying that, it's either two things. He doesn't really understand what welfare economics is, if my definition is correct. Or he understands what it is and he wants Bill Gates to, to learn more of it and to praise capitalism even further. So what does welfare economics, what does it not involve? It has nothing to do with government transfer payments. It has nothing to do with housing, providing housing. It has nothing to do with government assistance. That is a welfare state. So there's welfare economics and then there's a welfare state. And it seems that David D is confusing this too. And like I said before, there is a problem when it comes to his definitions. There's a problem when it comes to his concepts of economics. And that's why they really don't stand on solid ground in my opinion, right? And so I wanted to give an example of welfare states, right? And I wanted to, people say they look at Sweden, look at Norway, look at Denmark, look at, they're doing so well. So let's go for welfare, uh, a welfare state. But there's so much that, that, that meets the eye. If you can check this graph behind me, right? And perhaps I'll take the role of, uh, I'll just point it out, right? So the start, the beginning, this one is around in the, back in the day, in the 1870s. And you can see that Sweden is moving toward, this is Sweden. And in all of this, it's a free market economy. And that's where most of its GDP, most of its growth is happening when it operates under a free market. So what happens when Sweden goes into a welfare state? This is what happens. The second part of the graph, the drop, right? It drops, the GDP drops, and it keeps on dropping for a long time. And this is what most economics say, that during this drop, the only reason why it did not drop significantly so was that this period generated a lot of wealth for Sweden. So the drop, it was able to sustain Sweden for some time as it dropped. And then the Swedish, the Swedes, right? They realized that this thing is not working. The welfare state is not working. 
So they started some reforms in the 1990s. So you can actually see when you look at the economics, a welfare state does not work. The GDP grows when it's a free market economy, when capitalism is at the root, when the invisible, invisible hand is working. But a welfare state, it leads to a drop, as you can see from the graph. And eventually you, might, you must change it because it won't work at the end. So guys, I want just to do two examples, right, of countries. Let's go to Norway, right? People say that Norway is one of the best countries to live in. It has one of the best, you know, okay, living standards, uh, income per capita and all those other things. But here's something they don't tell you about Norway, right? Norway has a population of 5.28 million people only. Nairobi, based on some <clears throat> website that I found, it has a population of 6.554 million people. So if that statistic is right, then Nairobi has a higher population than Norway. But Norway has resources. It's the fifth largest producer oil exporter in the world it's the third largest gas exporter in the world number five and number three when it comes to oil and it comes to gas and it has a population of five million so imagine the income that is coming to those people you might lie to yourself that it's uh, the welfare uh, economy the welfare state is working for norway if you don't have these statistics in mind because it's a small population with huge resources. So when it comes to per capita, it can divide those resources very well. So do not lie to yourself. The export revenues from oil and gas, they are almost at 50% of total exports for Norway. So when it comes to export, it depends heavily on, on oil and gas. The export revenues from oil and gas, they constitute 20% of Norway's GDP. So I'm hoping that you can now see this. It's not the welfare states that's actually working in Norway, but it's the resources, the amount of resources vis-a-vis -vis their population. So anytime people bring these ideas of a welfare state, that giving people uh, healthcare, giving people, uh, if somebody does not want to work, you give them money, these ideas, they do not work. And when you look at the statistics, when you look at the actual economics, they prove that these ideas don't, do not work. If you want to know the true nature of socialist countries, of these welfare countries, go to North Korea. Just go to North Korea. What is life like in North Korea? It has a planned economic system. A system, uh, yes, that system that where you, the state comes and plans for you. It plans for your welfare. It plans like a the school system, and it has those schools free until university. It has healthcare free for, what, for whatever reason. And all of these other things, controlling the economy, right? And North Korea pursues socialist policies similar to those of the Soviet Union and to those of China. And they have all failed. The economy of North Korea is stagnated. That of South Korea, it blossomed. Because South Korea moved towards the capitalistic system that's the US, North Korea moved towards the other system. More and more into socialism, where your welfare is taken care of by the state. And so what happens when you do that? Well, you see, like in North Korea, health services are free. They, what Uhuru is trying to do in Kenya today, like introducing universal health care. That's what North Korea have. And how is it working out for them? Most of the hospitals that they have today were built in the 60s and 70s. And that's what we'll have in Kenya. As soon as this uh, momentum of building stuff in the county stops, we won't have enough to build again. So in the 2030s, we'll be talking about hospitals built today. In the 2020s. In North Korea, it's a serious criminal offense to receive a red, to receive radio or television broadcast from outside North Korea. So this country is trying to take care of you. 
it's trying to keep you from the ideas that would uh, spoil your mind. Ideas from outside of North Korea. And in this trying to protect you, it makes it illegal for you to receive television broadcast from outside North Korea. Only high-level individuals that are allowed to access the global the internet. Only high-level individuals. So that's what happens in in North Korea, and you can see the results of that. For let me see if I can do this clearly. Right here, you have China, right? Here in this red dot, you have North Korea, and here you have South Korea. That blank space is an indication of the kind of development that they have in North Korea, which is none. And this would give you an idea of how these policies, where the state has more power and more control over you, where they go to. Development stagnates. It moves down. In the case of Sweden, at least they are trying to reform their country because the welfare state was bringing it down. In Norway, they still have oil and other resources to sustain them. But North Korea, it didn't have that organizational structure before they introduced the welfare state. The state where it, they take care of you. And that is what happens. And if you want more examples, you can go to Venezuela and you'll see what happens in Venezuela. So anyway, what's the irony of life? In this case, I don't know if you can read the tweet very well, right? But David Ndi, he responds to a certain economist, another economist, his name is Jane Derry, right? And he says that Jane Derry does not have a firm grasp of economics. And so what he does is that he pontificates instead of arguing with economics, with the economic facts. And based on this presentation that I've done, what have we seen? We have seen that there are no clear definitions when it comes to David D. When he defines terms like feudalism, when he uh, speaks about welfare economics, it seems that he does not understand it properly, right? When he speaks about the market economy, it seems that he does not understand it properly. And so they lead to unrealistic concepts. For example, where employment structure and ownership structures would be absent in a free market economy. How is it free when those things are absent? Aren't you free to give your labor? Aren't you free to buy something so that you own it? Capital. So what do this all lack of clear definitions and unrealistic concepts lead to? They lead to economic ideas that would not stand on solid ground. They would lead to one thing and one thing only. And that's socialism. At the end of the day, that's where they would go. And in this tweet, you can actually uh, see him. And he speaks a bit about socialism, right? Uh, he says that, yes, what he says that is, uh, Ndiari is conflicting between uh, idealistic market economy, right? And uh, capitalism. And as you can see from the further economics from the professor at Harvard, capitalism is very, very, very clear. It supports a free market economy. It's private actors acting freely. The government is acting indirectly at the back. And it, it should limit itself to justice, peace, and all, all, all those other things, right? So that's what we can see. Again, his definitions of capitalism, they're a bit, I'm not sure if they're proper. In my opinion, perhaps I need to learn more about economics. But as I can, I don't think so. So anyway, he shared an article back in the day. And in this article, again, I'm not sure if it's clear, but you can, what he, it says at the top is that uh, socialism should come back. That's what it says at the top. And so sharing an article does not mean that you support socialism, right? But sharism also means that you want people to see something from it. In the NASA manifesto, right, because Devin D was an economist for NASA, we found a lot of socialist ideals when it came to the NASA manifesto. One of them was controlling rental prices. I think I argued against that. 
Another one was controlling food prices. I also argued against that. And so, at the end of the day, from what I see from the arguments by David Lee, it all ends up in socialism. And even though he does not want to say it directly, because we all know the mainstream economic thought is that socialism is bad, so he does not want to go against the mainstream thought, he develops these definitions. And these definitions, they do not really hold water. Because when you examine, examine them one by one, you'd actually see that they are unclear, that they are unrealistic, and that they lead to ideas that do not stand on solid ground. And the final I, uh, question that I perhaps I'll touch in future is his war on religion. He'd actually say that he does not have a war on religion, but he does, he's warring on religion. And that's, again, a hallmark of socialism. Socialism fights religion. Capitalism supports it. So anyway, that's what I had for today. Uh, please subscribe again to my 919 subscribers. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Please subscribe. Uh, and share these videos. Do not hide light where there is darkness. And pray for me that I may not flee for fear of the wolves. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. And take care. And share these videos. Pray for me that I do not flee for fear of the wolves.